Good afternoon, everybody. We're about to start. My name is Ruby Belgan. I'm the librarian curator for African Studies, International Development Studies, and African American Studies here at the UCLA Library. Um, currently, I'm um, also interim head for international and area studies departments here in the library. I would like to begin with our land acknowledgement. So if you would bear with me. UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongba peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tobanga, that is the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honuk Vetam, the ancestors, Ahi Hirum, elders, and Eyo Hinkem, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to welcome you, one and all, to today's event. <clears throat> Armenian poetry exploring the Los Angeles voices is part of the ongoing literary series that we call Opening the Doors to Contemporary Literature, organized by the International and Area Studies Department to engage with creative writers representing literary traditions from around the world and covering the areas that we focus on across the globe. With that, I now hand you over to my colleagues, Nora Abertian and Elena Ising to introduce the actual program and our esteemed speakers. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I would like to welcome you to our library and uh, I would like to introduce Shahem Ankeriam. Uh, he's the principal of St. Gregory Armenian Hovsepian School in Pasadena and Director of Mentorship at International Armenian Literary Alliance, uh, IALA. Uh, he'll be discussing his inaugural poetry collection titled History of Forgiveness, uh, which was published by Fly on, Fly on the Wall Press in the UK. Uh, Shahe is, um, is a recipient of the Los Angeles Music Center's Bravo Award and he served as the co-editor of the Los Angeles Writing Project from 2011 to 2019. Welcome, Shahe. Uh, and Artur Kaitsakian, I'm just going to introduce both authors, uh, poets, so then we can begin our uh, program. So Artur uh, Kaitsakian is the winner of the 2021 Black Lawrence uh, Immigrant Writing Series Award uh, for his collection uh, which is titled The Book of uh, Reducted Paintings. Arthur is the recipient of the Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and serves as the Poetry Chair for the International Armenian Literary Alliance, IALA. Uh, and his work has been featured in several publications, including Taos Journal of International Poetry and Art, uh, Chicago Review, and the uh, Prairie um, Schooner. Thank you for uh, being here again, and uh, please. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, the library, for organizing this event. Uh, so we're just going to talk. And in between, we're going to read some poems. Um, Arthur and I go back maybe seven, eight years. Uh, and we have a small group of poets that we meet once a month in Pasadena or different parts of the city. Recently, we've been doing it via Zoom. That has created a whole new platform.
platform for us as poets. But uh, the interesting thing about this group is we're five of us, and the, the group goes back maybe 15, 20 years. We get, we get together every month religiously, and we write, and we share our work, and we critique our work, and we're brutally honest with everything that we do. Uh, there's no egos when we get to the table. There's no def getting defensive. We just take it. You know, they don't like a line. They tell they tell me or they, we tell Arthur. Arthur, that line is not working. And Arthur and but we don't stop there. We definitely help him or help the writers uh, improve the writing. And by the end of that meeting, which probably lasts about two two and a half hours we have sort of cleaned up version of what we brought in. And to me that's sort of, it's a good place to start. We were talking about writers, Armenian writers in Los Angeles. It's so important that writers have a family that sort of, when they get to the table, they understand each other's history, they understand each other's background. Uh, all of us are Armenians, yet we're part of the diaspora, which is another interesting layer. Uh, Arthur is from Iran, I'm from Lebanon. Uh, different Armenians in the group from different backgrounds, Syria, uh, there's a population of Armenians from Armenia. So the, the beauty about it is when we sit at the table, we become a family, a family of writers, and it's so, so important to have that, to have each other to say yes that works and then we the other interesting thing about this group is out of the five members three of us are already published with our books that came out and because we were so encouraging of each other that you got to send your manuscript out you got to take don't be afraid and we share each other with each other the rejection slips that we get and we collect rejection slips until we you know after you send hundred of those uh, you know, <laughs> manuscripts out, one, finally you get that one email or that one letter that says, hey, and this guy over here got two of those letters within six months, right? <laughs> within the span of, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience of how, as a writer in Los Angeles, you get you know, we, we find success somehow when, when we're at it, when we, you know, monthly you get together and you know that you have to bring this group your writing. So share about that a little bit. Uh, sure, thanks, Shai. Uh, first, thank you, UCLA. Uh, thank you, Nora. Um, uh, thanks you to the library for uh, having us here today. Um, yeah, I am from uh, Iran. I was born in 77. Um, I was born on a war-torn block, actually. Um, my first memories of Earth was uh, sounds of gunfire, smell of chemical, and um, a lot of screaming. Um, there were good times, too, but now when I smell like vanilla ice cream, I, I think like it's, it's, like ter there's like ter it's like terrifying in, the, in my body, right? Like, um, that's because I, I was... Um, I was born on a street during uh, about two years before the Iranian Revolution started, and the street that I was on was a heavy gunfire, and so I knew, I I felt what death was like before I could understand the concept of fear, right? Because like I'm a baby, you know. Um, but yeah, coming to America and um, just finding my roots and writing. Uh, fast forward to that. Um, it hasn't, you know, it always starts off not easy, right? I don't think anything's really easy, especially the more you want something, the harder it's going to get until it's not hard anymore because you just, you find your way, right? You find momentum. At least that's how it's been for me. Um, I think I submitted to like 30 places before my manuscript was accepted. Um, and that's just the, the latest version I went through so many versions of this book. I had characters in there that I took out and so many clumsy attempts to put it together, getting rejected, feeling down on myself, wanting to give up, you know, all the things that uh, as a human we, we go through in life, right? Many waves of failures. 
to get to um, just a window where something seems possible. Um, and then I was faced with, I, I'm not going to name names, uh, but um, for this book, I was, I, I already felt that this book was, I, I was proud of it, and I've never felt like that before. I've never really been proud of my own writing. Um, maybe poems here and there when I, you know, like you read to your mom or something and your mom loves you, you know, <laughs> you know, but like, um, really on a professional level, like when you're playing for the big leagues and you're like submitting and it gets scary, you know, because all, all these eyes are on your work. This was the first book that I felt good about. So even, even if it didn't get picked up, I still was proud of it. And I think that's when my desire and my will was aligned, um, you know, and that's, that's important, right? What I'm drawn to and what, I'm, what I desire are usually separate things. And if I'm not aware of it, it can pull me into different directions. But I think this one time my desire and what I'm drawn to was, was perfect. Um, and that's what happened. You know, I, I put a budget of $300 aside, sent to 30 places. Poems started trickling in and then um, I got two presses. I think I, I, what was it like? I was telling you, it was like, it was like two or three awards within like a, like three months. That's like unheard of. Um, it's hard to get one. And it, it, to me, it shouldn't be the reason to write. Like if I'm writing for awards, I'm never gonna be writing. I'll never write a good poem again. I know that. Um, it, 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 it's, it's important to stay passionate, compassionate with the work, with, to, to, stay, to stay in a place where like you're attentive to the world, where the world stays your teacher when you're writing. I, I really believe that. Um, and uh, so, you know, I had a couple presses that wanted the book, and uh, that's when it all really started, you know. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, so it'll be great to start this conversation with, since we talk so much, we we're, built, we're building up this group that we get together and they tear each other's work apart. Um, let's read a poem that the, that the group really went at it at mm. some point. <laughs> so uh, I'll start. Yeah, I know you're going to look for a poem. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I, I want to read a poem that um, was brought to the group. And I'd like to give a little background about it. Um, like Arthur said, he came from Iran, I came from Lebanon, and I, we left Lebanon after f experiencing the civil war of 1975. Most of you probably don't even know what that is or what happened there, but Lebanon for 10 years was immersed in this very, um, passionate, let's say, war between two sectors, Christians and um, Palestinians, I would say, mostly, and um, it was just, and we were in a place where we witnessed, we were on the Christian side, and we witnessed everything. Uh, and again, just like Arthur, I was a, a child, witnessing all the brutality of war, or a civil war. <clears throat> and then, in 1975, my father, with the urging of my mother, finally decided to move to the U.S. as refugees. And once we got here, uh, Los Angeles was another animal that I never expected. You know, coming from a Lebanese civil war, this country was just a shock to me. Going to elementary school here, um, and we will talk more about that, but the, the poem that I'm going to read, again, was brought to the group and they workshopped this, is about the day that we fought my dad, we moved into this house in Pasadena area back in 1979. All the luggages are there, uh, the house is empty, um, and it's a moment that I'm capturing. I like capturing moments rather than just these vast, Paintings. It just is one. If if you can't think of a painting, it just is one endless 
minute section of the painting that I'm describing, and this is a moment that my father and mother are dancing in this new house that we just moved into in America. A new dance in old clothes. I see mama sway in a satin dress with faces of sickly chrysanthemums on the seams. He, clean shaven, wears the tattered suit, the one he wore to his wedding in 1963. Mama cries on father's shoulder as if she cannot forget a secret admirer. Beirut is dead, she says. Father caresses Mama's marigold hair and says, America is safe, like an underground shelter. As I watch them, I rest my head on a suitcase full of Lebanon. I don't trust the stillness, Mama whispers. Like our disobedient sheepdog, I don't want to sleep because I don't want to miss the kiss. Farid al Atrash serenades the war-torn couple as father pulls mama's waist to close the gap. Again, this was all done with the help of my friends in the group, uh, moving stanzas around, cutting lines, and sometimes these lines are like your babies. You don't want to let go. And, but they tell you, should I use it somewhere else? You know, it doesn't work in this poem. So this is my poem to start. Uh, Shai, uh, your work really, I feel like you and I parallel in the way where we're like war babies. You know, like you come from Lebanon to the U.S. I came from Iran to the U.S. really during times of turmoil, right? And I feel like the war, in, that the war inside of us really seasoned us as writers. And I think that's what makes us Armenian diaspora writing in Los Angeles, right? Like the combination. Um, so with that theme, um, so the book of Redacted Paintings is really, um, I've been obsessed with not necessarily a painting, but you know like if there's a painting or a portrait on the wall at your house and then you remove it after years and there's like dust collected on the wall and you can almost see the phantom or the energy rectangular or square space of the painting like you can see the it's like the phantom of the painting still exists on the wall almost where like the air filaments like in that area would probably be different if you were like an air scientist or something and you like measured the difference between the air adjacent to where the painting was and the air inside where the painting should be right that's kind of what I did. I mean, you can tell I thought about it a lot, a little too much. Um, but that's, I've been writing from negative space um, for most of my, um, for the past three, four years. And this poem is, um, it's called Reading with My Father. My father used to say, a book is the song of the body. The way he scraped the sound out of each word before he turned the page. That a book smells like plywood beneath the hot sun of Abaddon. He sat at the edge of my bed, held the spine and read as if the inside of a rock is made of dreams. My father, who after reading to me each night, loved to shut his door, turn off the lights, and sing to himself. So, yeah, beautiful work, by the way. Um, and I like the fact that a lot of poets are storytellers. In, in so many ways, we're telling these very compact stories with maybe 100 to 200 words, and you're hoping that sometimes it does have a beginning, middle, and end. Sometimes it just starts in the middle. Sometimes it starts at the end. Uh, but it's... So many ways, it's like a short story or a novel. You know, they have that quality. But what I loved about poetry is its compactness. It's that tight. Uh, you know, in this little room, you're telling this vast story with hundred words or two hundred words. Um, what? Tell me a little bit about your background. When did you feel like 
I like this. I like what I'm reading. I want to do this. Do you remember that moment? Yeah. When, it, when, it, when I started to... When I started to write about what's not there, but I could see it. You know? Say more. Um, I, I started to... Uh, I, I started How to find... How old were you? So I've been writing since like the sixth grade. Um, I think it started with like nursery rhymes. I was writing like A B A B, and I would take it to school and I would read it to my friends. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was fun. But why did you start that? Why did you do it? It just came to me. I don't. I don't know why. I just. I think I just. I found a way to make sense of uh, depression. You know, like I just. I kind of grew up like feeling disconnected from everyone. You know, like I didn't belong. Like the the group of friends I had, they always talked about things that seemed interesting among them there was like a circuit of energy going around when they would speak and i just felt like i had to fake that energy because i didn't really feel it you know i always felt like isolated and i pre the only time i really felt like myself was when i was writing and why did you find how when how did you find refuge in writing when did you first time you wrote you oh this is good mm, i think it was uh I've never really, I don't know, like, I, I guess, like, when I really, uh, it was probably seventh grade, maybe, like, when I, when, I, when I was like, oh, yeah, I could do this. I had a, I didn't English teach, her name was Miss McGrade, and she made us read this story called Dangerous Game, and it was about being hunted. I didn't know it was about, like, it was, it was a classist um, kind of story about someone who's not as wealthy, who gets stuck in this guy's house, who's really rich and bored of his life so he, he he puts people in his exotic like maze and he hunts them it's pretty despicable um but that that's when i kind of i kind of understood the philosophy behind that and i was in ninth grade i'm like yeah this is this is my jam you know <laughs> like, this is this is like I, I would love to like write about that you know um tell me tell me so like what is flip the question on you yeah i mean uh, i Ever since, I would say, I can remember being a child in Beirut, we had books in our house, and this, they were stacked. My dad would bring these books from Armenia, actually, when Armenia was this part of Soviet Union. So we would, he would buy all these Armenian books, and we had these two giant libraries in the room. And my rationale was, anything after my height and up, those were the dangerous books. Those were put there so that I cannot reach them. So whenever no one was there, I would climb the library because they were, it was very sturdy, big, heavy. So I would try to see what's on top. What are those big, and they're usually those big books on top. The little ones are in the bottom. So, you know, they were probably like dictionaries and encyclopedias that were up there. And I would just spend hours just looking at these pages and. Um, not being able to read, obviously, but, you know, the words, and uh, and then I used to watch my dad, when you read about your dad, I thought about that too, I would watch my dad read, and you know when there's this peacefulness that, that when somebody's reading, especially my dad was so boisterous and sometimes, and then but when he was reading, he would, he would transport somewhere else, and sometimes he would smell, sometimes he would get sad, and I would think, that's what I want to do. I want to make my dad cry. Or, I want to make my dad laugh. You know, that's, there's so much power in that. That this thing, whatever he's doing, reading, has so much power that it may, can make someone laugh out loud all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, he's reading, and then you hear him laughing, uh, or crying, or being moved this way. So I, to me, that's the genesis of, I think, when I started writing. But I was writing in Armenian as a little kid. But once I came to Los Angeles, and this was the 70s, this is where in America the movement was, forget your original, the, your first language, you need to learn English. So they would put us in these basements with computers, those big giant computers with headphones, or tape recorders, and we had to like listen to what it was being said and repeat. Uh, that yeah. was the time where yeah. I had to sort of lose my, language, the first language, and 
sort of take this new language in. Mm -hmm. And there's a poem that I wrote about this recently because my, the, my first book is, deals with my childhood in Beirut uh, growing up. My second book that I'm working, the manuscript I'm working on is that move to America in that first couple of years. It was a shock. Uh, and dealing with letting go of the trauma of Lebanon and now dealing with this new shock. And this is the first time that in America, my English teacher, Mrs. Hanze, uh, gave us a poem to memorize. And the poem was uh, Trees by Joyce Kilmer. I don't know if you guys know this poem. It's uh, <laughs> back then, every elementary kid would learn this, memorize this. It's called Trees. I'm going to read the original. It's, I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Mm. So this was given to me to memorize as um, I don't know, maybe two or three months in America, and that my teacher, Mrs. Hans, is saying, you need to memorize this. Because all kids memorize this poem. This is, you know, being part of being American. Uh, so I wrote a poem called Trees by Joyce Kilmer. You have the shortest poem, she said. Memorize it by Monday. I grabbed the laminated strip before asking, this Kilmer, what has he killed? I wanted to believe he terrorized neighborhoods in Beirut. Actually, Mrs. Hanzi said, Kilmer died in France by a sniper's bullet. On the bus, I stared at passing trees with more intrigue than the words on paper, like pressed, bosom, and God? By Saturday, I lost a poem and killed birds perched on pines with my slingshot in front of my classmates on Monday. I barely remember the first line. I think I shall never see a poem. I stopped, darted to my seat, and cursed the Creator for making words and trees. I love trees. <laughs> That's, what's, what's interesting about um, that, about your second project that you're working on, so you're really going, you're really going into, uh, to me I, I call that instinct memory. Right, it's like you have your memory. You know when you're a child and your 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 like your frontal cortex hasn't really developed yet. I guess if there's any science teachers here, physiological science. Like I'm sorry, I butchered that. But uh, you know, you're, the frontal lobe. Yeah, the frontal lobe, right? Like it's not fully developed, right? So it's like we rely on our senses to remember things, and like to me, poetry is kind of like that. It's like you know when I'm writing like in this abstract way. That's what I did when I first started, and it was just like, I used to say things like, I'm frustrated, or I'm disappointed, but that doesn't do much for the reader, right? Like, because the reader's like, okay, why should I know that? How is that rewarding for me? What am I gonna, you know, what's in it for me? And um, I think it's important to activate sensibility, right, when we write. So, um, I started to really write in, in this concrete way, like using language of the senses, right? What, I, what, I, what does disappointment smell like, feel like? What does it remind me of, right? What is, how does it feel under my fingertips? How does it taste, you know, that kind of a thing. And um, I started to use instinct memory to, to really write. And so when you're asking when I was like, yeah, this is good, I think, I wanna, you know what? I wanted to read a poem from uh, my book. It's called, it's called Translation. And it really describes um, just like these, these fragmented lines 
So if you take like a word like war, right, and they're just basically a bunch of definitions and phrases, right, and uh, it's like broken up, and uh, here I'll read it right now. All right, let's see. One of the things that we did was we wanted this conversation to be very organically built because the only foundation we had was right, Armenian writers in Los Angeles. And we just said, okay, let's see where that's gonna take us. So. so this is a translation of, I guess, Los Angeles after a war. It's just called translation. As in the night that wrecked my hands, a city of crows daggered through the sky. As in a skull of complex nightmares, the black owl of my mouth, a box of dreams for strangling, as in hope, as in my mother's voice, as in we avoided the mouth of a door forced open, as in the quiet voice of God crashing through the lifeless, a separation from animal, from spirit, from gentani to hoki, as in salt turns an ocean nocturnal with its smallness. The night between us has a restless gap, as in birds flutter, as in cage, as in a wild hive of prayers under my breath, as in we live just one more breath with segments of light, as in we live in a city dragged to the sea by the hands of its night, as in the sugar of a dying language, the scent of ash and a bashed indoor, as in smoke rings blown from the mouth of a glorified general, as in river, then a slice of jail, of wine stain, the torture of praying, as in history, as in we wait with white men for metal doors to slide open, as in instead of anger, we have flower petal weight on our shoulders, as in psychedelic, it's okay we smile, it's not okay we know, as in more red than music, more curfews dropped on our homes than nightfall, as in memory, as in the threaded rasp of my mother's voice cloaks the siren, she walks closer to me, ever slowly dropping parts of her dark sky. Instead of radio, a ghost picks up a stream, a frequency foreign to the ear, as in, we flee, we dance, moonwalk in our shadows, we fall, as in, we fall through our mother's lies for safety, we live beneath the yellow death of sun, our language a summer bomb mixed with extinction, as in, I was delivered from war when my mother fired up the lie barricaded in her breast to save me, as in, bandana, as in, these days I feel mm, ill-gotten, which is to say I'm rugged, as in I stare hard at a painting before I take it with me. As in, my friends call me the Armenian Persianist, an immigrant with a junkyard smile. As in, my friends dress like wolves, as in, joy has been swept to the aftermath of bodies mangled, as in, ill, as in, cough from the small of my delicate son, as in touch, as in we lock lips under the flicker of lights in a dim-walled hallway. My crime is not so much in denying my hunger, but the great extent I went to hiding my ability for loss. As in ship, as in disembark, as in the English language, as in technology wheeling its way into my mouth until my broken native tongue spits out words in boats of abandon as in the war, as in on us, as in the nights a city howls in honor of its body count, as in the cemetery has grown jealous of the city and the evening tucked in its blade so the sunset could live. Wow. You know, <clears throat> beautiful stuff. Uh, what resonated to me was that line that you said, Instead of anger, we have flower petals on our shoulders. That's pretty damn good. Um, and sort of it reminds me of, to me, I take that as, you know, we came to America, 
there was a lot of we had anger, there was a lot of trauma that we were dealing with, and thank God we had books or writing that sort of like that was our flower petal. Instead of going right, we went left to save ourselves uh, from being destructive. Uh, we could easily become destructive um, because our, our earliest, the foundation was we watched men behave very animalistic. You know, and it was easy to go there during the moments of rage. That's why that, to me, that resonated. That whole uh, the mantra that you went on—it's—it's uh, it's, all of it is true. All of it is the part where you know they, the junkyard. Uh, what is it? Junkyard smile. 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 Yeah, that to me, you know, reminded me of my a poem that I wrote about those moments where you're trying to find yourself and back then there wasn't no politically correctness uh, you know sometimes even that to me is interesting where people are trying to be politically correct so i don't know if they're being genuine or they're just being politically correct you know that sometimes i question uh, what is that uh, back then though 1979 there was no politically correctness they were just brute kids were in the playground being brutally honest and if they were being racist they were being brutally racist they were there no there was no apology uh, you can complain to the teacher that they're being racist i don't think there even was that kind of a concept that you could go to the teacher and say teacher they're making fun of me the way i'm dressed or the way i speak i don't think there was that kind of defense so <clears throat> the poem like you said that I wrote about this moment uh, on the playground. Uh, there's a poem that I wrote recently again, and I have taken this to the group, In America, First Day of School. And man, that first day of school, my mom made me dress up the way we dressed up for school in Beirut, which is, <laughs> you had to wear black leather shoes, uh, black socks, and then nice pair of pants, freshly uh, pressed, sh white shirt, uh, so, and you know, my hair was combed to the, you know, with a, and I went to school that way. And the minute I walked to Field Elementary School in Pasadena, I had a crowd around me. Black kids, Hispanic kids, a Asian kids, white kids, they were all surrounding me. And I was not understanding what they were saying, but they were saying, they were talking about me. They were laughing, they, so I remember running home that day, saying to my mom, now listen, to, I want to go back to Beirut, I don't care if there's a war, I'd rather take that than what I experienced on the playground today with these kids. So my mom, poor woman, she had to get on the phone, call my aunt who, who had been in the US since the 50s. She was, what do I need to do? And she said, take him to Sears, and buy t-shirts and jeans and tennis shoes. <laughs> and that's what my mom did. Took us to Sears, we had to buy t-shirts, tennis shoes and a um, pair of jeans. But this is m sort of being, the, being poetic of that experience. In America, first day of school. Because mama mispacked the baggage from Beirut, I wore a pair of Jesus sandals with silk socks, a bleach-stained Tenten t-shirt, a parachute pants with a defective zipper. I felt naked in America, ate my lemony sandwich behind a whipping willow, avoided upside-down laughter on monkey bars, girls trapping boys in hula hoops, the chant killed the camel jockey in the jungle gym. I wanted to run to the library, seek a dark corridor, find an exchange student from Iran, squat next to her, cover my eyes with a copy of The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, and cry, cry, cry. That's, you really right. like, what I love about history of forgetfulness is, you really get to the heart of uh, 
some really vulnerable moments and I think you execute them so well. How did you, tell, tell us like, when, when you access that kind of memory, like in that moment where you say cry, 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 what, how do you get to that moment? How do you, how do you uh, through layers of, of, of like, you know, the draft? The yeah, draft that's process. a good question. And I think recently I read about Robert Frost, he said, you know, don't plan your poems. Because once you plan it, there's no element of surprise at the end. You just start, you just start the first line or two, and you just trust that it's going to take you somewhere. And when you get there, it's going to be, you're going to feel the surprise as a writer. And, and I, after reading Frost, what Frost said, I thought, yeah, that's, that's it. That's what we do. And when it's really good is when we get to the end, we go, how did I get here? Like, there's some that, you know, we used to call the muse that worked through you and you got somewhere. But once we get to that last line, when you get like goosebumps, you go, aha, uh -huh, this is where I want it to be. Hmm. But whenever I do plan it, it somehow doesn't work. Uh, because there is no element of surprise. And I just trust it, that it's going to get, take me, and I don't know how I got to the cry, cry, cry part. Um, and I think, to me, it's just to be, you have to be honest to yourself as a writer, mm -hmm. fearless, you have to be fearless. You, you cannot think of the fact, I cannot write this because people are going to read it, and my family will read it, my wife will read it, my children will read it. That's the other big one. My students might read it one day, uh, and I remember when I first this book came out, and my students bought it, and one of the first things they said, they call me Baron, Baron. That's an Armenian thing. They said Baron, there's an F word in here, <laughs> and they so it was, and I never thought that they will ever ask me about that, uh, but. Now it was a moment to teach, and they, when can you use the F word in your writing? And mind you, these are seven and eighth graders. Mm -hmm. So it, you can have an honest dialogue with them about writing, about language, about being true to yourself, being honest. And I personally think the way it's been used, I use it once in the whole book. But I think the power of it is you used it once, and it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I almost feel like if you overdo it as a writer, it's going to lose its meaning and power mm. in a writing. But that can become, in, with any word, I think, it, you use God too many times, it's going to lose its power. Yeah. Um, but um, <clears throat> I, I'm like, now I'm thinking, should I read the poem with the F word in it? <laughs> I think I should. Uh, you can handle it. <laughs> Can we use uh, a bad language? I'm it's, uh, let me, uh, yeah, I didn't even think about doing this one. Um, why, do you have something you want to add on to what I said? Maybe you can read something if you have it. Uh, I look for it. Okay, um, so since we're talking about the writing process, mm -hmm. this is a series, in 2017 I was working on a series of <clears throat> these poems where if you take like Armenian proverbs and Armenian words and you translate them literally into English, you have some strange English words. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word in Armenian, it's called achkatsak. And it, it basically means like you're greedy. Like, and achk means eye, tsak means hole, means there's a hole in your eye. Right? Or like, a, like I guess like the, the bars, like the, the Persian Armenians say chetes. That's like another way to say. Right? Like, so, okay, so this is. Um, Ajgatsak. All right. Ajgatsak means to have a hole in your eye. Chetes is when you have not seen enough, as if you have a hole in your eye. As in, since I have never seen home, every house is a home to me. To not have seen because the eye has been gouged out of your head is called war, says the invader. But to not have seen war coming Troops bursting through the door on a family of four is a massacre, which is due to the blindness swelling inside the invader. The same way a snake slithers through the eye of a skull. When the invader sits at a dinner table and devours a roasted pig, he has a hole in his eye his stomach cannot fill. 
someone might ask him, do you eat your emotions? This is only possible for the eye that harbors a hole. To eat through the eye until there is a hole is cannibal. To eat through the eye because of the hole is history. Wow. Now every time I use the word Auschwitz, I don't think about the poem. Uh, so I will follow it up with the poem that I was talking about. The title is Bibliophobe. That's a good it's poem. the opposite of Bibliophile. Bibliophile is a person who loves books. Bibliophobe is someone who hates or dislikes or has fear of books, which Whenever I wrote this word, I looked it up in the edition, but whenever I was typing this word, it was always like with the red line under it saying there is no such word. But it's in the, in the dictionary. Um, so what, I have to give a background of this poem. When the war started, all of a sudden, uh, the metaphor that I use, the war starts seeping into our household between my mom and dad. And the, the war sort of, I was looking back as a little kid, I'm thinking one of them wanted to stay, the other one wanted to leave the country. And that created this chasm between them. And there was these constant arguments and fights about it. Uh, and, you know, and then it becomes about money, just like any other, and you know, the root of all evil is money. You start fighting about that. Uh, so it just became this very uncomfortable. Now imagine there's a war going on outside, and there's, in your household, there's this constant, this dysfunction and um, you know again this is a time again all of us know in the 50s, 60s, 70s marriages were not uh, purified I would say the way it is I don't even know if it's purified now but it, when battles happen battles happen in the household um, this is called bibliophobe father cracked mama's tooth with the spine of a book Maybe he didn't like the lima beans in the lamb stew. Maybe he lost his page when the pressure cooker whistled. I remember she grabbed the stovetop to steady herself. Father tapped on the hardcover with his knuckle and glared at Mama's legs full of goosebumps with no sign of quiver. I slurped the soup to distract his anger. Mama dabbed her mouth with the apron. Steam covered the kitchen windows. Father didn't say a word, but I wanted to scream. I hate your fucking books. You know, the one thing about about Shawhead, he, you know, when you meet him, he's like this delightful guy that smiles. And, you know, <laughs> but when you read his poems, man, <laughs> that's like, it, you're, the precision you have to, to, to your images is, you know, no pun intended, deadly. Like, the, you, um, I think what's, one thing that's important about um, writing, I, I think I, I read this in a book called uh, Words First Order, for, few words, I forgot what it's called, but it's by Stephen Dobbins, and he was talking about the image, and he says, you know, you're going to come across a lot of images when you're writing, you know, they're going to they're gonna form in your mind, There's gonna, it's going to be like a phenomenon, and you're going to want to write it down, but it's kind of like a gamble, because there are some images that will dilute your poems, and you seem to know, it's like poker, you know when to fold the images and to put the ones that are going to keep the potency of the, like, the emotional effect. And that's what slays me every time. Yeah, I mean, that also you do that as well, but yours is, I feel like, man, I wish I could do what Arthur does, which is, you're so playful in a, a masterful way. Like, some of the images that I saw, I wish I could go and, but then we can't copy each other because, Arthur's style is Arthur, I do my thing. Um, we envy about what you, each, you, what you do. Uh, and if you see the book, when it comes out, it's coming out next month? Yeah, um, May 26, actually, in a couple. The book is yeah. coming out May 26. He does some very experimental stuff in it. Yet, 
the stories are there, the images are there. And I think your question is, man, I used to love, and I still do, storytellers. I, my mom was a storyteller, my dad was a storyteller, and it was one of those moments where when they started telling stories, everything stopped. You listen. And I loved what, when my mom's friends came over, and they're having coffee, and I would just be in my bedroom, and I'm not supposed to listen to their jokes and laughter and their stories, but I used to stand there in the doorway and just listen. And you know, that those moments are priceless. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost that, I think, as a, you know, these poor kids, we've given them this, and this is more entertaining to them that, than going in the living room or in the patio or uh, in the backyard listening to friends come over and having these amazing stories. Uh, and to me, those were gold. Those were moments where they knew exactly when to stop, who, you know, when to shift to another story. Uh, and I, I think as a child, subconsciously, I picked that up. When, what are good places? Good, when is it good to use humor? Um, and I'm sure you had those too. I mean, you, you can't be a writer if there weren't good storytellers around you to influence you. Growing up, it could be a dad, it could be this uncle who had these amazing stories when they came over. Um, watching them, listening to them, you learn the pacing, rhythm. Um, so that to me was uh, having them around. My mom, my mom had this weird thing that happened. She would start a poem. Whenever I said a sentence, or anyone in the household said a sentence, she would take that sentence and remember the Armenian poem and she would just start reciting. Mm. And we would just stop and listen to this woman recite. And the most beautiful thing that happened to my mom, toward the end of her life, she went to dementia. However, she never forgot the poems. She would forget our names. She would forget who I was. But I would ask my mom, can you recite the Tekeyan poem? And all of a sudden, like, she, would, she would, every word she would wow. remember. Or like a, you know, verse from the Bible. She would just go off and go like a page of just Bible memory that she had. Mm. And to me, that's amazing. That the power of words. That, that if it's in you from a young age, if, if, imagine you're in the dementia, and the most beautiful words are coming out of your mind, rather than you know, uh, damning your children to hell that you're going to kill me in this uh, home that you put me in. But it was just beautiful while sitting there. We would just egg her on. Mom, recite this poem, and she would gladly do it. And the title of the book comes from that, History of Forgetfulness. The whole book is about the, the war in Lebanon, except for this poem. It's in America. And the funny thing is the name of the book comes from a poem that has nothing to do with Beirut. And it's called History of Forgetfulness. She might finally forget my name when she's dicing onions on the chopping block. For now, mother can't pinpoint my daughter's birthday. She recites random months like January and August until I remind her it's in July. She forgets to swallow her blood pressure pills, so she leaves church early. After she calms her heart, she drinks Turkish coffee. No one knows why she clips coupons for Campbell's tomato soup. She makes illegal U-turns just to make sure the burner under the pressure cooker is off. She can't sleep at night because when she closes her eyes, she remembers everything. You know, that's, there's a lot of PTSD in that mm -hmm. poem, like, and I think to some extent, you know, we've, uh, like I was talking to my therapist and she was telling me about complex PTSD, which is, I guess PTSD would be more traditional, like you, one war event, but for most of us, at least immigrants, I know that I've moved to three countries, beat up a lot from a lot of kids that don't look like me. Uh, been ridiculed by teachers, authority, priest figures, and, and you know, students growing up. There's a lot of CPTSD. 
mm. right? And, and that can't keep, I, I really relate to that staying up at night part. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, um, and so like, I'm not gonna say much about the second book because I'm still working it out, but the back narrative of this, uh, this book that I'm writing is about this young Iranian boy who uh, is living in the 1980s in Iran and uh, it's the time when Khomeini, uh, you know, you get draft. Once you turn 15, you get drafted to the war, right? But this kid's like, you know, he's a painter and he's good at math and he has soft hands, you know. So when the Revolutionary Guards come for him, they see they're like, we can't put this guy in the front line; he'll get killed. So they just sentence him to uh, Ira an Iranian death camp to work as cleanup crew. And so when he escapes, he comes to the U.S. Now this is all backstory. Like if I was writing a book of fiction, I might explain this or like you know I have like show you scenes of this, right? But in a, in a in a book of poetry, for those of you that are interested in writing this way, if you have a strong narrative in your mind or in your heart or somewhere in your body, your poems can speak through the hearts of the characters, and they will curate themselves in your book. Right, because you're just kind of revealing them through the narrative. Um, so I wrote this one poem where he, the, that boy's already escaped, and he's become, you know, in the spirit of being at a university. This is called lecture hall physics, velocity, speed of sound, and poetry. So he's like a, he's like an astrophysicist, but like also a poet, and he's like teaching this physics class, and this is his lecture. Uh, does it, you, you know, you guys know what a, an Ars Poetica is? Anyone know? An art, okay. So an Ars Poetica is like, it's like a poet telling you what poetry is in the poem, right? So this is kind of like that, all right? While it is maddening for us to compare death camps to poetry, there is resonance in their comparisons. So today we will continue discussing the sound of a rifle and poetry by investigating how death travels. We know the speed of a bullet will increase its mass, and its calculation depends on its projective velocity, which considers many variables. Air friction against the bullet, atmospheric pressure of clouds, sun-beaten temperatures, and so on. Since a bullet travels 1200 miles per second, which means the muzzle velocity moves faster than the speed of sound, which means a bullet moves through time quicker than a bell or a horn or a lullaby. You are struck before you hear your mother's laughter leave the barrel. I remember this poem. This is the poem. Yeah, I brought it to the <laughs> It reminded me. I don't. I don't know how much time we have, but um, are we good? Um, okay. So, it reminded me of <laughs> you talked about your science class. I remember my science teacher in high school. I went to Pasadena High School, and I, for some reason, I don't know what it was. I did not like science. I hate to say that, but I wish I did. Um, but I had this beautiful teacher, uh, Mrs. Saka, that pretty much figured me out that if I don't become engaged in something, I'm going to become a troublemaker in the classroom. So um, she basically figured out who I am or what I'm interested in, and this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Biology 1A. Dear Ms. Sakaman, you made me sit in the back room next to the skeleton because I distracted Freck Margie, the albino football player with specs, and you. You cluttered periodic table or the video on the mitosis of onion root drove me near suicide. I screamed in anger. I don't want to be a scientist when I grow up. You nodded and erased a blackboard full of evolution. Dust fell. I want to be a writer, I said. You nodded and led me to the back, to the toothless skeleton, smiled, 
sharpened my shriveled pencil and asked me to write. Mm. And that was her thing. She said, whatever you see in this classroom, you write. And the next thing I know was learning science because I was basically the note taker of what was going on as she was lecturing. And sometimes that was the title day. I would say, hey, when you're looking at the blackboard, this one kid in the back was messing around. So you should know that. Don't turn your back too often. And then all of a sudden she would do this. She would be writing on the wall and she would call the kid's name. And the kid would be like, how did she know that I was messing around? So it was, it was a beautiful relationship. And many years later, I saw Mrs. Akram at a restaurant. And I said, hi, Mrs. Akram, do you remember me? She goes, of course I remember you. She said, are you writing? I said, yes. And she goes, that's all, that's all I wanted to. And I thought, you know, these are, these are the beautiful teachers that we've had in our lives that guided us. Uh, uh, they sort of recognize what we want to do. And I hope that happens in schools more often where teachers recognize and they help you. And in the process, you know, you learn science, math, history, uh, language. So uh, that was my ode to Mrs. Sockman. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, thing. That's actually, makes me think about, sometimes I've learned more from researching on my own and writing poems about it than, I, than I've had people telling me to like, do something. Yeah, like, you know, like, you know, like, um, you know, like passive learning, you're sitting in a classroom and the professor's like lecturing, right? And you're like, I, I t I've taken notes too, I've learned that way too, but like, um, there was there was a there was a poem that I remember I was working on I was I was uh, I was reading about uh, you know Shamiram mm -hmm. and uh, there was one line that struck me out of the National Geographic about her she uh, she you know the story of Shamiram is interesting she uh, she fell in love with Aram the beautiful Aram 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 the beautiful yes and and um, I guess he said no to her. And so she waged war on him, killed and threw him on the roof, and hoped that the gods would lick him back to life. And that's where we get the phrase, licking our wounds, right? I don't know. Um, yeah, so what I did was, actually, I was writing about Shaminon for a while. and But there was this one line that, I mean, it's just this one line, and it was random. It says, you know, legend has it that she was raised by white doves. And I'm like, why isn't there more written about this? <laughs> you know, so so I decided to do it, and this is um, this is called uh, Shamiram. In her youth, she wore a white dress to blend in with the flock of doves who raised her. She lifted the pleated skirt of her dress and let it drop. It did not lift itself and flap again the way she craved. Her cousins who were gray pigeons resting on rooftops and ledges, swarmed around her, kept her warm. Every so often, a bird would land near the sunlit windows of her room, draped with curtains, splendidly blowing in the wind, carrying the mystery of her wingless life. She lived featherless, learning to fly within. You. So um, I would like to open it up. Maybe as some, maybe you guys have some questions you want to ask. Um, hopefully, we did not bore you, put you to sleep. Um, but I truly enjoyed talking to Arthur, um, and we do this before you guys were coming in. We were having. I wish the mics, mics were on. We were having this long discussion about the importance of, you know, Armenian writers having a space, maybe having our own place where we can actually have readings and uh, where we can publish books. So it's fun to sit there and just, I, I can sit here with Arthur, we can talk for hours on end about writing and, um, you know, the, uh, the process of creating um, you know, it's, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time in America. America keeps you very busy to sort of, uh, so that you don't have to do, or you, 
I hate to say it, what you're passionate about, because the passion sometimes doesn't make money. So you have to do your duties as to make money, and then hopefully the American gods will be kind enough to say, okay, now you can write a poem. You can have time to write a poem. At least that's how I feel. I don't know if... Yeah, totally. I, you're, you're on to something there, like about America being more about soul production than soul examination. Mm. You know, and, and uh, the more you work, the less you think, the less you have time to talk about things. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it makes, you know, that's, that's a good topic. Or, you know, uh, if there's anything you guys want to talk about, maybe you just go, hey, you know, thanks, I gotta go. Like my friend Alec Ekmanich, who's a writer, he retired. Uh, as, and now I think, man, he's now doing writing, reading, he f watches films that probably was on his to-do list of, I gotta watch this film, but I need three hours. So now he's watching all these great movies and he posts them, I go, oh, Alec, I wish I could do that same thing. On a Wednesday night, I can watch a film <laughs> till midnight, you know, with a glass of wine. Uh, yeah, that... I'm envious of that, where you can just, just soon, not soon enough, <laughs> but again. But on the other hand, I also value the fact that we work, and through that work, there's so many inspirations. You're collecting these uh, moments, and you know, I love working with students, uh, younger ones. They say things, and you, you try to put that in the memory bank somewhere, you go, I will write a poem about that. The way they phrase things sometimes is so wonderful. Um, I, I'm sure you do. You hear things, or I, I know when you're reading papers and the kids are, you know, trying to BS their way through writing something. But in that BS, all of a sudden something beautiful comes out. They write a sentence or they write a paragraph. They go, oh wow. Yeah. I know they didn't mean this, but it just sounds amazing if it's if we can steal that idea and use it in our writing somewhere. Uh, and I mean, we do steal. I mean, writers do steal a lot from reading. Uh, like you said, you read a line that just took you somewhere. You know, that one line, one sentence, one image that does these wonderful things for writers. Um, I mean, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, when I, I tell my students, I teach composition, so it's... Uh, it's hard to get students motivated, especially when they're not really writers. There's like, you know, they're like, it's like general population, great kids, uh, but they're usually engineering majors or nursing majors. And um, a lot of them are coming out of high schools out of the pandemic, which um, I understand was very difficult to, uh, to prepare for college on Zoom, right? Um, so one thing that I think drives students is when I tell them, you know, we're all gonna die, right? Um, do you want misspelled language to remain when you're gone? Like, is that is that the best? When you put your, because essentially when you're writing, you're putting your soul in ink. The dead tree is gonna outlive you, right? Whatever you write is gonna outlive you if it gets on print somewhere in some file, whether it's published or in someone's database your remains will be the letters after you. Do you want to be careless about that? You know, and that, that seems to work for about five minutes. <laughs> you know? say, Man, I, I, I'm scared of your class now. <laughs> um, yeah, that's good. No, but I mean, I, I get what you're saying, and one of the most depressing moments, I think, right now is ChatGPT, where I'm thinking, okay, how can I motivate kids to write when they can ask the AI to do it for them. Um, so I almost, I'm praying that writing in class comes back as a way of doing things. Without the computers, bring the blue books back and kids have to just write, handwrite things. I know it's gonna be pretty painful for a while to handwrite things, but I think that we need to go back to pen and paper and start writing in the class, uh, not these research papers that they're, it's completely going to be pointless. Uh, again, so, yeah. 
you talked about the politically correctness, you know, and as opposed to um, smiling and uh, so. What is your preference? You know, uh, I think we all have that um, dilemma that do we want to be honest or do we want to be polite? Some, in some places you want to be polite and some places you want to be honest, but honesty has a cost. Right. And so, yeah. Uh, Nora was asking, I don't know if you heard it, about when I talked about being politically correct versus you know, some people try to be politically correct, they're smiling at you, but it's a, they have to do it because they're, it's sort of required of them to do it. Which one do, do I prefer? Do I prefer the honesty, tell me how you feel, or versus hide yourself behind being politically correct? you have any ideas on that? I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. I think there's a, I think there's a difference between being honest and vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and also, if whenever I'm going to be honest, I'm always going to ask myself, is it going to hurt the person if I'm going to be honest? Like, if I go, man, that, you know, that, your jacket really smells. Like, no, what? no, no, but I meant you know? in your poetry, in your poetry. Oh, in the poetry, okay, okay. Yeah, um, well, okay, so I'll give you an example. Like, I think you can be honest as a performative, and that it can be pretentious. Too honest, too on the nose. Could you smear your like truth all over the page? I don't. I, I think that's more gimmicky. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like you know, it's like if you're gonna write your book, but the things that you could have told your therapist, you may want to revise that book. You know, because um, to me, it's it's easier to be that honest, but the craft is in. Like sometimes honesty on the page can push you away from being vulnerable. Because like you're just like, you're saying so much that like the reader can't register the amount of, it's like intensity doesn't equate to intimacy, right? And it has to be, it's, it's, it's a negotiation with the page. You know what I mean? Like um, you can, okay, let's say for instance, as a writer, you were, um, you had a hard childhood. Right? Let's say there's sexual abuse, right? If you just write the explicit what happened on the page, that's that's courageous. But it also it I feel like it wouldn't do the work of being vulnerable because it's really talking about the action rather than how that affected you. And and and, and to let that process, right? So I think there's a difference between being honest and, and vulnerable. You know, and plus that's why there's a, a lot of times I feel like people get offended when uh, from work when because often if we haven't processed something and we write about it and we might not see how the angles have blades on them, you know, and that that can happen too, you know. Oh, that's a good question. It's a good question, and I was I kept thinking, what's the what's the purpose of art? My mind kept, you know. Why, why do we admire people like Van Gogh or um, an opera from uh, Mozart or, you know, why do we admire these work of art and why are these works timeless? You know, they, you know, to this day we still admire these with Shakespeare, or, you know, and the, I think the, that equates that whenever you're putting something into the world, at least my understanding is your this book it's going to leave a little dent of beauty in the world, or the, if a, an opera from Mozart it's going to live, once it's all said and done it's going to leave a, a, like those flower petals you know you're putting these petals into the world um, and you know the things that we admire the things that are very timeless are those individuals who actually left the world in a better place after they left. Uh, they might have had very controversial life when you look at their life, but their work left a, made us in a much better place, a much beautiful place in the world. So, um, again, politically correctness, I don't ever think about that when I'm writing. I never th sit there and think as a writer, 
I better be politically correct in my writing. I, you just you have to be true to yourself, and hopefully all your demons that you have, even if there's narcissism, uh, racism, that hopefully by writing you're dealing with that. I think that's another reason why writers and poets and artists, part of it is they were trying to heal themselves, whatever they were going through. Sometimes they were overtly, and somewhere they were doing that, you know, uh, very um, subtly they did things, but at the end of the day, it's to me, it comes back to that flower petal. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't even think, I, I'm, I don't think I talked about the part about the political correctness, I just went some other direction. But, um, no, I think you addressed it. It's the, um, yeah, go ahead. So, like, in terms of political correctness, there was a time when people would write, per, like poets would write persona poems, where you, you know, you like a, like a, like a man would write poems as if the self of the poem is a woman or a girl or someone non-binary, right? Or you know, or you write of a, a you might be like uh, Asian American and you might write an African American character. We're not living in that political climate right now, so the persona poem would get a lot of writers into a lot of heat today because of identity politics. Which is sad because identity politics then, what happens is um, it affects creativity. But I don't think that's the time right now. Like, okay, I'll give you an example. Um, if you take like the, uh, in, during the Enlightenment era, like Edgar Allan Poe, mm -hmm. you know, the dark romantics, right? They were, the, they were writing, to me they were writing politically against the established colonized uh you know establishment like that because like the, during that time in the like you know the victorians like they the virginians sorry they uh, when they settled then they turned their efforts to writing poetry about beauty and and you know aesthetics right but that's born out of settling and settling hides the 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 the, the terror the massacre the colon the, you know the, the the colonialism and 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 the efforts to get there Right, these were poets benefiting off of the the raping and pillaging of that time. Right, um, we're not in that time again. So to write a persona poem now is like you might as well just commit career suicide. <laughs> it's like you know because it's like the best thing I, I would do is write from my own experience and not pretend that I understand someone else's. You know, and I think that's that's. That's just what it is right now. So you're saying Shakespeare would never be able to write Othello now? I don't think Shakespeare would get a lot with get away with a lot today. I mean, there's a lot of like a lot of English professors who are just like stop. They stop teaching Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. You know, there you know because there's so many other voices. There's there's uh, there's you know there's black poets, Asian American. Like there's so many so much unexplored land um, in poetry that because like every. Most schools that I go to, or have been to, I was never a fan of the classics. I read them and I enjoyed them, but they were never my experience. Like Shakespeare's not writing about Armenians from Iran. Like I, you know, in Canterbury Tales, but you know, let's, let's not even get started on that. Like it, I, I can't relate to that. Right? Those weren't the things that got me to be a, a writer or a poet or an English teacher. Right? It's Wanda Coleman or Terence Hayes, you know, to write about what it means to be. Uh, you know, an American immigrant, but written in sonnets, right? I might start with like Shakespeare, but I'm going to get to the poets of today, that, and that really relates to the to like nowadays. If I try and teach, if I try to teach classics to students, they're going to tune out, you know, unless you're an English major, right? And that's what you specifically want, you know. Shit, I forgot this is being recorded. <laughs> okay, let's edit this part. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes, back there. Would you, you talk about ChatGPT AI stuff? Would you consider ever using something like ChatGPT in your writing? Uh, can I be honest? I've used it already. <laughs> Whenever I'm writing letters to the parents, I that part of my job I hate it because you have to write these generic letters to parents about. You know, don't you know about a COVID rule or da 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 da? Some I just put in the ChatGPT and they write this beautiful letter for me, 
within minutes versus I would spend like a couple hours and I have to read it to five people. What do you think about this line? Do you think we No, it's like uh, they do it. Yeah, that, I see the purpose of it. But like, uh, I, I can't imagine asking my students to do work, creative work and experiencing those moments of struggle and they will not know that. Oh my God, that, that's... I, I got I got a prompt. But here's something you could have students do. I write lesson plans using ChatGPT, especially ChatGPT 4.0. Oh my God, that is uh, it's great. You know, you just like have them. You know, it writes the like a brief introduction of like a lesson, and then I'll go in and I'll edit it. You know, it's it's a good like starter because those are the most boring things to write. Like it's hard. Prep is just like you know, prep and grading is just like kill work. Like kill me. You know. Um, <laughs> But it's true, you know, that's, but we do it because we have to, right? Um, the best part is being in class with the students and talking, right? But like all that, you know, teachers know what I mean. Um, in terms of an assignment, what if you did an identity paper where you asked students to write about themselves, but then you asked ChatGPT to write about them too based on what they know of them on the internet? So you have like a cyberspace perception of that person versus who they really are. That's cool. Comparing countries, yeah. So, so is it fair to say then that if you use uh, Chat GPT to write a lesson plan, that the students can use Chat the Chat GPT to write their assignments? No, because I'm committing plagiarism, but I'm not being graded. <laughs> and I reword it. You know, you re you know, if I if I publish that just as Chat GPT, that would be. That would be plagiarism. Yeah, um, I've thought about that. That's a that's a good question. I've had students. I use ChatGPT in my class for workshops where I have students. Uh, like I, they put the prompt in, and it'll it'll write the whole essay. But I I try to urge them to um, use it as a structure, especially for students who are struggling with structure in lower division classes where it's really hard for them to write topic sentences and stuff like that. You know. Um, but, but turn it in catches a, a uh, AI writing now, which is which saddened a lot of students. Those days of uh, AI are <laughs> they're not so good. But for for um, yeah. yeah, the point of writing a paper is you're basically wanting someone to you know tell us what they think, right? That's the point. Yeah. So there is there going to be a moment where Instead of the, if you're having a class discussion, instead of the student talking, you'll ask the question and the student will type something, please answer the professor's in-class question and the AI will do the thinking for the student and they will speak on behalf. They will say, on behalf of me, I'm gonna give the AI to answer this question for me. So that's literally what's happening. It's basically this, you no longer are allowing yourself to think you want somebody else to do the thinking for you. So will there come a moment where AI will also come into the classroom and talk to us, to the teachers, and then the teacher will get out of the way, the AI will be the teacher, and the AI will teach the AI. The humans will just hang out on the outside. If, if they're still around. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, AI hasn't, if it, if it doesn't turn into the Terminator movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if that will happen, but it's a really good question about AI. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I know that the college I work at, we embraced it. You know, the distance education department really tried to embrace it because we figured it, the future is here. Um, but yeah, it's you know, uh, try to use it as an as a as a tool, like a tutor in class. You know. Um, and some students use it to write their paper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did I answer, Mr. Ethan? <laughs> so I just have a comment. When I was listening to you guys, um, Shahed, when I was listening to Shahed, as you know, you said, you know, I was listening to a storyteller. And when I was listening to Arthur, I was listening to a composer in that sense. And it was very interesting, uh, the two of you talking to each other and complimenting really. Uh, thank you so much. It was very interesting. 
Thank you, thank you, Nora. It uh, really means a lot that we are here. Um, <laughs> Come again. But we will. Yeah, thank you. We, I have a board meeting to go to and I'm hesitating because I know how boring that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like taking my time. So thank you, uh, ser sincerely. Thank you. For being thank you so much. I would like to say, yes, we are at the end of this captivating afternoon where we explore the Armenian poetry in Los Angeles under the series Opening the Door for the Contemporary Literature that was actually established last November when we had a, a visitor from the Czech Republic. And since that time, this is our fourth literary uh, event where we explore all kinds of forms, not just books and stories, but today was the first poetry, and it was from Los Angeles, which is also the first time. And this was done um, together with Nora and I, we put this together a few months ago under the uh, International and Area Studies Department. And um, the chair of it was here in the beginning. Ruby, welcome. Thank you so much for your support. I also would like to thank my colleague Giselle Rios, who did make these wonderful designs. And when we were promoting this event, she was the one putting everything on social media and on the computer here. And she is a wonderful addition to our department. Also, I want to uh, thank my colleague Alice Ahant, who helped to set up this and always supports every event. Um, my supervisor and director, uh, Sharon Farb, who is not here today, but she is the one who paid for the food and mm -hmm. drinks. So, you know, we always have a lot of um, people who put effort in this organizing. And so I want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart. And um, we have also a student who works with us in the library, Pauline, who is working on processing uncatalogued Armenian collection. So thank you, Pauline, for coming. And especially to our speakers, Shai and Arthur, it was captivating, interesting, uh, beautiful. And uh, I just sit here with <laughs> open eyes and mouth like, thank you, I forgot about everything, all troubles in the life. And thank you so much for coming here to the library. And I hope we can do something similar. Maybe we can even invite the whole group of you, <laughs> five people. Uh, that seems to me like something so precious because as you said, now we are dealing with kids looking at the telephones and chat GPT, but it's, to find a group of people who are honest with each, with each other and help each other to progress, in this case, poetry, but just talk about life and talk about where they are in life and help each other with each sentence and with maybe advice in their life. I think that's precious and I really applaud to that. And thank you everybody who came. Uh, we love to have you and we will have another event, I'm sure. Uh, so you are welcome to have more food and drinks and just talk to each other if you still have time. You can also buy a book yes. from Shahe, he has some here, and pre-order pre for uh, Arthur's book, who, who is publishing book in a few days. I already have these, this book in the library if you want to borrow it. I ordered the book from Arthur just a few days ago, it's coming up, so thank you so much. Thank you.